Namaste and good evening. I, Swati Solanki, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special lecture on the city as environment as a part of the series, the state of cities, hashtag city conversations. The series is organized by IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. It is my privilege to introduce our chair for today's discussion, Dr. Rumi Ajaz. So, is senior fellow at Observer Research Foundation, Delhi. I would like to invite, so to invite our esteemed speaker for today's discussion. So, over to you. Oh. Is it my turn to speak, Swati? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I join you, Dr. Arjun Kumar and his team in welcoming the speakers, distinguished speakers and participants in today's program. Uh, I, I would like to begin with uh, saying that uh, of late or for, or you could say for a long time, there is a, a growing interest in, in cities. And uh, we all know the reasons behind this. Uh, the first important thing in this regard is about the, uh, the opportunities that the cities are offering to a large population in any country. Uh, so, as we all are aware about it, that there is a, a demographic transition that has occurred globally and also uh, it is occurring in our country at a gradual pace. Uh, insofar as the shift from rural areas, small towns, medium towns to large cities is concerned. Uh, the second interest in cities is uh, about it's it's uh, it's among many stakeholders, uh, people like us, people from the government, uh, and other organizations. They could be private sector uh, players uh, from think tanks, etc., uh, who are uh, making efforts uh, to improve the conditions that exist in the city. So. Uh, the effort or aim is to ensure that cities function in a better manner so that people uh, are able to benefit from the opportunities that cities are offering. Uh, if uh, we look at the global cities uh, around the world, uh, they, they, and we all know they, they are, many of them are a little ahead uh, insofar as when we compare with India. Uh, and even this, this is true for many developing nations uh, Southeast, in Southeast Asia, for example, there are many cities that are, are playing uh, an important role. Uh, they are prosperous. Uh, they, they have been able to address the issues of inequality uh, better than Indian cities. And also uh, the, the, the managers or the people who are working towards improving their cities are able to create an environment uh, which, which is like a people-friendly and environment-friendly city. Uh, when we look at the situation in India, uh, and all of us have been working on this subject for a very long time, uh, I think, uh, Indian cities are quite vibrant. Uh, there is a lot of activity that is going on. There is a concentration of uh, population and economic activities in cities. Uh, there is a gradual shift towards urbanization in the country. Uh, and uh, our cities are also playing an important role in social and economic development. Uh, but uh, there are several concerns also, each one of us are aware 
And that has to do the foremost in this regard, in my opinion, is about the quality of life that Indian cities are offering. Uh, and this could be understood by looking at the various sectors or the, the characteristics that Indian cities display. Uh, today's topic, I understand, is environment. Uh, and uh, when we look at this sector of environment, uh, and we, when we look at the different environmental parameters, uh, we find that these do not fare very well when they are compared on a global, in, in terms of global rankings, uh, whether it's air quality or water quality or drainage or sanitation or the green and open spaces uh, that exists in our cities, or it has to do with the noise levels in our cities. Uh, our cities uh, are not faring well and there is tremendous scope for improvement uh, so that a better quality of life is available to the uh, people in this nation. Uh, so in this context, I think uh, today's uh, lecture by the distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Avadendra Sharan, who's director and professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi, is assumes immense significance. It's extremely relevant given the conditions that are prevailing in Indian cities. Uh, in view of the unfavorable conditions, environmental conditions that ex exist in our city, it would be useful to have more discussion on this topic of environment and the characteristics that cities display. And uh, all of these inputs uh, would be very useful for uh, a wide range of stakeholders, whether from the public or the private sector. Uh, as I said in my initial remarks about the demographic transition that is occurring, uh, we, our country is still at a low level of urbanization when we compare with uh, other nations in the world that are 70 to 80% urbanized. Uh, it would be interesting to listen to Professor Sharan about his views of what he uh, thinks uh, of Indian cities and the current work that he has been engaged in on cities and to, and to, and to learn from him what is his vision for, for the future insofar as uh, Indian cities is concerned. Uh, it is my privilege and honor to invite uh, Professor Sharan uh, to kindly deliver the lecture. Shall we also have the introduction to this then? Sati? Yes, sir. And also please uh, introduce the discussion also. Yeah. In the lead up to uh, World Cities Day Eve, it is my privilege to introduce the speaker of our today's talk, Professor Avadin Sharan. So, is director and professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi. He has been trained as a historian at Delhi University and the University of Chicago. So his research interests are in the fields of urban and environmental studies. His research aims to develop an understanding of the urban as constituted through socio-ecological processes concerning resource use, waste and pollution, spatial planning, etc all of these being mediated by relations of power. His publications include Dust and Smoke, Air Pollution and Colonial Urbanism, Out of Place, Nuisance, Pollution and Dwelling in Delhi, to name a few. Sir's ongoing research is on domestic environments in colonial India. We welcome you, sir. As discussions for this discussion, we have with us Dr. Ravikan Joshi. Sir is consultant at Urban Finance and Governance, Professor R.B. Bhagat, who is professor and head at Department of Migration and Urban Studies at International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai. Professor Gopa Samantha, ma'am, is professor at University of Burdwan, West Bengal. And Professor V.P. Sati, who is professor at Department of Geography and Resource Management at Mizoram University. My heartiest welcome to you all for today's pertinent talk. Now, I would like to again invite uh, Dr. Rumi, sir, to initiate the discussion and invite our speaker, 
to carry this discussion forward. We really look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering today. So over to you. Thank you very much, Swati. Uh, may I uh, request Professor Sharan to deliver his lecture? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rumi. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to you. Uh, many of you I read uh, and learn from. So uh, bear with me. I'm not, uh, I'm not a policy person. And, and the way I research and write is not necessarily policy oriented. Uh, what I've tried to do for today's talk is uh, bring in two things. One, I mean, basic interest is in thinking about what we mean when we say environment and, and what are the different aspects of it. So what I've tried to do is, is bring together different aspects of what I think are important. And I'm going to mention some of these, some of these at some greater length than others. Uh, and I hope the distinguished uh, discussants and panelists will respond to some of these issues as also bring up other issues. Uh, I'm going to more or less read from the written text just for sake of time. Uh, do let me know uh, as I approach closer to half hour so that I can wrap up uh, the rest of the talk as fast as I can. Mm. Where we are at the moment uh, is a particularly difficult time to think about the environment. Uh, there's been one issue, there have been three issues that have been with us for some time. Uh, those of us who live in, in the large cities of this country have been familiar with issues of pollution. And we, we suffer on this count quite often. Uh, so that's one kind of issue. There's also been change of uh, talk of climate change for at least close to a decade now and, and ever since the fifth IPCC report came, especially about cities and climate change. So that's another kind of issue that we're kind of familiar with. And then came the pandemic, uh, which uh, you know brought in germs and viruses uh, into our consciousness. And one of the difficulties is, how do you think about particles and germs together? And that's something I'm trying to do in, in, in the research that I'm doing at the moment. And I thought uh, the home is a good site to think about these two things together. But we'll see when that res research happens, whether I'm able to, to bring them together. But it, there is a certain difficulty, uh, just given the range of things that get bracketed under environment, as to how do you bring them on the same page. Uh, I must also confess that there are many better experts on individual aspects and sectors of the environment uh, who have more in-depth understanding of it. Uh, my aim is to, is to have a broad conceptual understanding of what we mean and what policy implications could there be. So the first thing that I want to say is, I've argued uh, uh, earlier uh, that there's something quite distinctive about uh, urban environment in the global south. This distinctiveness uh, in the traditional literature was that cities of the global south are where 19th century cities of Europe were. That's a very common understanding. I've tried to argue somewhat differently to suggest that what distinguishes us is the fact that several generations of problems have come together. So questions of urban poverty have not gone away and environmental issues linked to urban poverty have not gone away. Questions of industrial pollution are very much with us. They're far from being tackled. And questions of climate change and pandemic have also come along. So one of the things that marks out the city in our parts of the world, especially if you're looking at environment, is this whole range of things that comes together at the same time. So that addressing them becomes a much more complex and challenging task than it would be where questions of, let's say, uh, water pollution has been tackled or air pollution has been tackled. Uh, in those contexts, you can look at other issues uh, more deeply, but in our case, all these issues are together and therefore we have to prioritize. In that prioritization is another problem. 
which is not only the sector that we choose, but the moment that we choose to address a particular issue. So we know, for instance, that winter is around uh, in a city like Delhi, talk of air pollution will now increase by the day and go on till about February, March. Then you have the clear blue skies and then we stop talking about air pollution in a place like Delhi. And scientists have been telling us for a long time, this is not the case. You have pollution right around the year. The air quality is bad right around the year. And how do you direct attention? when it's not visible, when it's not immediately perceptible. Uh, and that's another issue that comes up when we are dealing with uh, multiple issues at the same time. Uh, this becomes even more difficult if you think and take something like climate change, which is not immediately available to our experience. Uh, we, we have vague sense of things are warming up or the extreme weather events, but it's very difficult to conceptualize what it means to experience climate change uh, in, in many cities. And so if it is not available to experience, how do we talk about it? Uh, as you can see, the contrast with the virus is very clear. That is immediately available to experience. All of us who have been masked and socially distant for quite some time know that you can immediately feel the threat and the uh, what it can do to you, and you try and take care to protect yourself. So that's the second difficulty. And therefore, what happens is, is in addition to the seasonal and the multiple, what you get is uh, what is the local and the planetary or the global. And it is not always clear that what is good at a local level is also good at the planetary level and vice versa. So one again has to prioritize which one takes greater priority than the other. So one of the big challenges in any thinking about urban environment has to do with this multiplicity, uh, this, uh, this uh, availability to experience and this idea that the local and the planetary are not always in sync. And so you have to prioritize about it. Okay, so if that is the case, and we know there are environmental issues around. Uh, why should it matter? That's that's been a, a key question that I've asked myself quite often. And it seems that at obvious level, the answer is known to everyone. And yet, you if you probe it deeply, you begin to say that there are different aspects of why environment matters. And it matters differently to different people. So let me begin with, with why it matters and link to that the several other questions. If it matters, who should take action and what kind of action and towards what kind of future? These are all open questions that, that I want to speak about. Okay. So let me just read. Uh, for those of you who may not be too familiar with this history, uh, laws to control air pollution were first enacted for Bombay and Calcutta in 1862 and 1863. So at least going back about 140, 150 years. At this point, the issue was one of nuisance and pollution was seen as causing damage to property and therefore needing to be redressed. Now, these laws proved rather ineffective and new laws were enacted for Calcutta and Bombay in 1905 and 1912. And one of the things that I've suggested in a recent research that I've done is when these new laws were enacted, three different rationales were given. Well, there was a fourth one given that hasn't uh, uh, been taken so seriously, which was that the law was enacted in Calcutta to protect the Victoria Memorial and the marble from, from worsening. Uh, the first is an aesthetic argument. And the power of this aesthetic argument should not be lost sight of because it has implications. So Lord Curzon, who was uh, the vice chancellor, uh, vice chancellor, who was the viceroy uh, between 1899 and 1905, uh, he brought about a significant change in the way uh, the British ruled India. Now, Curzon was an arch imperialist. Uh, there's absolutely no two, two ways about that assessment. But he was also a great modernizer. And one of the fears that Curzon had 
was that the Brits would lose out to the French if they did not get their act together. And so he started promoting a certain kind of imperial presence, which relied on experts to give advice. And one of these experts that he called to India dealt with the matter of air pollution. But this is why air pollution mattered to Curzon. And it's interesting to read what he had to say to the Bengal Chamber of Commerce in 1903. And this is Curzon and I quote from him. But there is one superficial feature of Calcutta that has greatly distressed me. I allude to the Calcutta smoke, which sometimes makes one forget that this is an Asiatic capital, which besmirches the midday sky with its vulgar tar brush and turns our sunsets into murky gloom. So this is the a certain view of the city as dark, as, as gloomy. And a, for a person like Curzon, Calcutta should not become Leeds or Sheffield, like any mid-sized industrial town of UK. This was an Asiatic city and the capital. So he was concerned about its beauty, as was Sadhuraji Tata speaking about Bombay. And uh, this is an interesting side story of uh, when the first electric plant, uh, when the first hydroelectric plant was set up by the Tatas at Lonavla, one of the arguments given uh, was that it would help curb air pollution. And uh, this is what uh, Sadhuraji Tata had to say on that occasion. Just for a moment, think what a glorious city Bombay would be if freed from a smoke. Being so closely associated with Bombay, I'm perhaps too ready to believe it to be one of the most beautiful cities in the empire. I'm sure it will be acknowledged to be such by everybody, if only it can be rid of the smoke nuisance. And I venture to add that it can also be made one of the healthiest. Uh, this idea of the city beautiful has not quite faded away. In our own times, uh, the question of air pollution is as much about a global image as it is about anything else. And uh, this is something that you can read in the newspapers every day. Uh, this, this idea that it does not look good on a global stage for, for Delhi to be so polluted, etc. Indeed, as Asha Ghatna has argued in his book on contemporary Delhi, much by way of urban environmental interventions is driven by aesthetic choices. Others, such as the sociologist Amita Bhaviska, have suggested the same, designating contemporary environmental concerns as bourgeois environmentalism, in which the key concern is with control over space, ordering urban and rural spaces, so that the threat of disease, crime, and being assailed by unlovely sights and smells is minimized. This is what the environmental justice movement in many parts of the world calls the NIMBY phenomenon not in my backyard. It does not eliminate pollution. It does not mitigate pollution. It simply relocates it spatially and socially. And one of the things that worries me when we talk about environmental issues and cleanliness is whether the act is designed to reduce or to curb or to mitigate pollution or are we simply ensuring that the trash is no longer in front of our eyes, it has gone somewhere else? And quite often I think that our policies are driven by this logic. So if you look at what we did with industries in Delhi, uh, if they were to be shut down in Delhi, it was not as if polluting industry shut down. They simply relocated to neighboring states as and when they did. So what it have in this phenomena is a, is a certain argument for relocation, taking things elsewhere, and keeping your own space, your own home, or your own city beautiful. Uh, there's nothing wrong with beauty, but uh, as a researcher, I'm concerned with what the implications of this are for different segments of society. Who benefits, who loses out in this process? Okay. <clears throat> Aesthetics apart, there are two other ways in which the question is also debated. The first had to do with efficiency. In this perspective, smoke was or is nothing but fuel that has not been burnt adequately 
such that the unburned carbon escapes through chimneys and into the atmosphere. And one of the interesting debates that happened in the colonial period was therefore, if it's an economic question, if it's a question of waste, who should it matter uh, for? And there was a strong argument made in Bombay that this is a matter that only concerns industrialists. It is their loss and therefore they are the ones who should be most concerned about it. And if you are going to set up an authority to deal with this issue, that authority must have the municipal engineer on board. In fact, the argument was strongly made that do not bring the health person on board. It so happens that in the council debates of that time, Sir Firo Shah one of the early Indian nationalists, makes a strong counter argument saying that the interests of industry and that of the general public and the health of the public do not necessarily coincide. And therefore, it is important that the health specialist also be brought on board. But this did not happen. And, and one of the things that has remained as a legacy issue is how do we approach this issue? As a friend of the industry, as an antagonist, as a neutral observer, but how do we approach those whose activities cause some of these problems? And, and industry has ar always argued that you leave it to us to take care of it, uh, just set the standards and leave it to us to take care of it. And we are equally concerned about the health of our workers and the health of the city. And sometimes governments have not necessarily agreed, but this economic argument, you can see also resurfaces in interesting ways. Uh, in discussions on circular economy, in discussions on energy efficiency today. So there is a way in which what we consider environmental issues have got related to issues of resource use, use energy consumption, etc. And that part of it, again, has a legacy that goes back some time. The health, of course, has become the most prominent. And this is the argument that we hear every day that we need to take care of our environment because our health is at stake, whether it's water pollution, air pollution, whatever it is that we're talking about. If it is climate change, we are simply talking survival, forget health. But that has emerged as the most important argument. Uh, in the health argument, uh, two things are happening, which if I was a, uh, I was a policy person, I would worry about. Uh, one is, uh, this periodic demand that where is the Indian data? So anytime that there's a critical report, typically our governments respond by saying, where is the Indian data? And my friend uh, Rohit Negi has written a wonderful book uh, on contemporary debates on air pollution in Delhi, where he takes on this question centrally about what is this demand for Indian data? What does it mean? What does it do? The other thing that has happened is more difficult, uh, which is that in the concern for health, it is entirely possible to forget the environment. So if you look at what, how we talk about COVID, that has got entirely medicalized. Uh, the idea that there are environmental issues related to COVID is somewhere on the margin. Sometimes China, sometimes bats, sometimes we talk about those things, but it is usually somewhat far off from where we are. We are more concerned about the availability of oxygen, about our health, about our ability to survive this, uh, pandemic, and, and these are genuine concerns, but it can happen that the focus on health can sometimes even take you away from the environmental concern. Okay, uh, that's the second part of it, uh, which has to do with aesthetics, economy, health. This, these are the kind of reasons for which environment has historically mattered and continues to matter today. The third thing that I want to talk quickly about, so who should intervene? Uh, and how do you intervene? Now, in the colonial period, uh, I suggest to you, uh, there was an assumption that the government would do everything. Uh, that's because the British government gave to itself the only legitimate power to intervene. Uh, civic associations were not welcome. And neither did they emerge uh, in, in the colonial period. In our own times, of course, uh, there are many civic associations that are concerned with environmental issues. And the governments of the day do rely on several kinds of experts. Uh, to solve their issues. There are two things about uh, this expertise that I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, one is 
this expertise is now far more distributed. Uh, we don't fully know how expertise functions today in the age of social media, but you can see it is no longer this uh, old fashioned, you know, two or three top guys who are the experts who then consult with the government and then you arrive at a policy, but expertise is flows much more widely, is much more distributed and has different channels. Having said that, uh, I must also say uh, that there does remain for many people uh, this idea that environment is a technical matter to be solved through technical means. And you can see that uh, uh, in, in many kinds of interventions, to take a very quick example, uh, you see that in uh, when governments uh, approach IITs, for instance, to give them solutions. Uh, I'm not saying uh, there's something wrong with this. I'm saying there are technical experts and technical experts matter. But for me, the environment at the end of the day has to be about the kind of lives we want to live. And the kind of lives and the cities that we want to build is a question that involves politics, sociology, philosophy, ethics. It is about the ends of life. It's about what kind of humans or species we want to be, what kind of world we want to create. And if those are the questions, then I think it is important for policy makers, for policy circuits to recognize that in addition to your demographers or your scientists and those kind of experts, you do need people who, who come from the humanities, who, who talk about values, you need people from the social sciences, and therefore addressing an environmental concern today requires many kinds of disciplines to come together. And that is something that is often not recognized in policy circles. Indeed, if you ask me, every time that I have gone to a meeting, the social scientists and the human uh, people from the humanities would be in a minority of one or two. And meetings are largely dominated by, by, by science, uh, scientists uh, when it comes to matters of environment. Uh, again, as I said, don't get me wrong on this, there's nothing wrong with inviting scientists uh, onto the board. Uh, I find it limiting not to have other kinds of disciplines on that table. Okay, do I have 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Rumi? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll take about 10 minutes to talk about a new research that I've started. I'm excited about it. Uh, and I'm trying to use this uh, platform to explore uh, whether this makes sense. <clears throat> this is something that has come to me most recently, as I said, uh, during the COVID. Uh, my earlier work has been largely around, uh, uh, around uh, environmental understood more generally, uh, concerning the, the atmosphere or water, but things outside our homes, and largely being about particles and waste and things like that. Now, what the COVID has driven home is the presence of germs and viruses. And what I'm trying to do is, is see if I can uh, bring these two, three different uh, scales and levels of things together in one body of research. I feel that the home is a very good site for doing something like this, but I'll see as the research progresses whether I actually achieve what I think I want to do in this. Okay. Uh, the question of scale, uh, when we think of cities as environment, uh, I've argued elsewhere, and as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, borrowing from the literature on political ecology, I do believe that cities are both social and natural entities, and that resources flow into and out of the city, and they have impacts in the way they flow, and the way they flow out, and these impacts are obviously governed by relations of power that exist at any point of time. But writings on the Anthropocene have posed an additional question to us to think of interspecies relation and to think on a planetary scale, linking land, oceans, and atmospheres to geological time. Indeed, if we ever needed a powerful reminder about how different forms of life are linked to each other, we have got it from the form of COVID-19. And as I said, a lot of this has been medicalized, and the environmental aspect have, has kind of receded from our uh, site. And as and when China or the bats are mentioned, it is more about geopolitical positioning rather than about environment. But there's some very fine literature out there. 
which for instance looks at are elephants refugees in a way that people who cross the Mediterranean are refugees. Uh, when, the, when they enter the villages, what is the status of these elephants? Uh, so there's a great deal of thinking that's going into this thing. What is the relationship to other species? Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, how may we bring the human and the non-human together? Bring our everyday domestic routines and home atmospheres into a dialogue with planetary life. The choice I'm suggesting is not which side do you privilege, the home or the city, or which scale do you choose, the global or the planetary, but whether from any side that one chooses, one can take into account environment at different scales and in different modes. This is not going to be easy for certain, not for researchers, nor for policymakers, but try we must. So let me try and do this uh, in the next few minutes and then I'll wind up in two to three minutes. First uh, is about climate thinking, some introductory thoughts. There's now a considerable literature on, on cities and climate change. Two kinds of questions get asked frequently. How do cities contribute to climate change? And how may we adapt? And what I'm trying to do is, is, is push these two questions to see what else do we need to take into account. So how do cities contribute? How do cities contribute to climate change and how do we adapt? Climate thinking had featured prominently in colonial settings. By the 19th century, the distinctiveness of Indian climate with its heat and humidity that made radical, which was radically different from the climate of England, also began to be thought of in racial terms. And I'm not going to go into that history at this moment. Uh, but two things happened. Physical transformation of cities was undertaken on a large scale, largely around widening of streets. As alongside this, means of obtaining comfort and dealing with heat and humidity within homes also began to find mention. In part, this had to do with architecture, the value or otherwise of traditional features like courtyards and balconies in ensuring proper ventilation. In part, attention was directed to the means of cooling with the aid of technology. In the past, tatis had been used across India, handheld pankhas had been used, but with the advent of electricity, and this is a history that I, I, I suggest to you if you're interested, is one of the most interesting fields in which new work is being done, which is histories of energy use and electricity in India. There's some fascinating stuff that's going on there. With the advent of electricity, however, an entirely different new means for obtaining comfort became available. More natural means of cooling being replaced by those that relied on mechanical means and hence the use of fossil fuels. In addition to powerful factories, the Indian Textiles Journal editorialized in September 1899, electric power would light our cities, propel our tram cars, pump our sewage, load and unload our ships, etc., etc. Companies equally were effusive about what electricity could do. If, I mean, if there is a revolution, electricity is the revolution. It completely promises to transform life. Taken in the aggregate, access to electricity within homes remained restricted. But there's little denying that urban sensibilities had begun to change. And new notions of comfort and efficiency, especially for the middle class, was here to stay. So that's the first phase, where in the British period, uh, in the colonial period, electricity first comes around the turn of the century 1902, 1903. Very quickly, uh, the uh, demand uh, emerges for the use of electricity in homes, outside homes, and uh, there is this feeling that electricity will transform the world in many different ways. Uh, the other energy source is gas, and there's a big tussle between energy, uh, between electricity and gas as to which will win. Uh, electricity wins in the, in the lighting department, in the heating, gas wins in the kitchen. And uh, so there are these very interesting histories of, of, of the play between electricity and gas. This issue, of, of whether you can afford electricity or not, and how much of it can you afford, has been consistent throughout uh, you know, the last 150, 200 years. We still worry about our electricity bills, how much we should consume is a fact that depends on the kind of bills we want to pay. However, uh, I'm suggesting that a very different kind of question emerged in the 1950s. And this had to do with planning for Indian cities, 
uh, that came of, of age in that period in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there's a, a, a talk uh, given by Albert Mayer, the, who was the chief American consultant for the Delhi plan. Uh, it's a talk he gives to architects at the Lalitkala Academy in 1959. And Mayer's argument is that we must minimize, and I quote from him, the need or temptation to incorporate air conditioning in a country of limited resources and of limited available electric current. So this is no longer about individual households. This is about what the nation can afford. And so Mayer goes on to say that the objection to the use of air conditioning was not only related to the fact that 95% or more of the people could not afford it, but also because India did not possess the necessary resources, either of water or of electricity. And so when the, you know, there's a study done of Delhi, it's, it's called uh, climate, Climatological Study of Delhi, uh, carried out uh, at uh, Texas. Uh, and in that study, they make a specific mention that we are not going to discuss air conditioning or coolers, uh, because that's something India cannot afford. We have to rely on uh, architecture and design to solve issues of cooling, heating, etc. Finally, I'm suggesting that resource constraints, however, had its limits in restraining the temptation or the need to use air conditioning. Uh, there's an air conditioner right behind me on the wall. Uh, post the liberalization of 1990s, the availability of a greater variety of these technologies at cheaper prices, combined with long-term social changes, has implied a far greater energy demand in middle-class homes than before. According to one study, there was virtually no air conditioning in Kerala before 1990. Since then, it has grown at 20 to 30% annually. So you can see the, the tremendous growth that has happened in the use of these, in, uh, these technologies. And the consequence has not only been uh, for the economy, uh, which is an argument that had been made earlier also, but also uh, for local environment and climate emissions. In another uh, study on Delhi, uh, Khosla, et cetera, have pointed out that India's urbanizing middle class is at the brink of an unprecedented increase in residential cooling demand. As a consequence, energy use for space cooling is growing faster than for any other end use in buildings. Stephen Graham has referred to this as air con urbanism, which first began in USA and Europe and is now finding purchase in the rest of the world. Climate change is both a cause and consequence of this. Heat removed from interiors of the homes of the privileged is dumped outside, further exacerbating urban heat island effects. Greater heat combined with climate change related temperature rise in turn creates even more demand for air conditioning and consequently greater use of fossil fuels for electricity generation, which in turn implies more emissions of greenhouse gases. The attainment of comfort is thus no longer about economy and resource constraints alone, issues that were flagged earlier, as I said, but has to do with the very future of life on the planet. In brief, over the course of the 20th century, cities have moved from celebrating wonders of electricity in providing thermal comfort in the early 1900s to worrying about resource constraints around the middle decades of the century to now pondering over the implication of our choices for greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. Through this, different notions of need and comfort have been at play with cooling options relying simultaneously on more energy efficient technologies and on the possibility of rediscovering earlier traditions of passive cooling through appropriate construction and design. In, so in this time period, we've gone from thinking about modernizing our homes to worrying about climate change. And this is the final point that I want to leave you with. Uh, it, is, it is how we understand this transition. The act is the same, which is a very simple act of wanting to cool your homes. The technology and the, is also uh, something that's not changing every day. It's been around, it's stable, air conditioning came some time back. And yet you can see that the same act is read very differently at different moments of time. And one of the things that, that makes uh, it interesting to have people who do historical stuff or have people who, who look at literature 
things like that, is to bring out these stories of change. So, so when we think of environment, if we remain conscious that the meanings that we attribute to our actions and to our desires change over time, and that if you want to act in a way that you build better cities, you have to account for these changing patterns. So quite clearly there's been a change in consumption patterns. Now, if we don't understand the desire for different kinds of consumption, we don't understand the kind of cities that we'll build. And therefore, uh, I once again suggest to you that thinking about environment today is certainly to think of uh, technical solutions to specific problems, but it is also to think of the many ways in which we read meanings into our actions, or sometimes indeed refuse to read meanings into our actions. We, we do our thing and we believe that we're doing the right thing and if the world is fine. But whatever it is, you need people from different backgrounds, different contexts, different geographies, different social classes, and certainly different genders to be able to put their perspective on what they think when they say that I'm concerned about the environment. Thank you very much. Sir, you also had some pictures to show. Oh, I did. I, I did. Uh, it, well, okay. Very quickly, let me try this. Uh, okay. Okay. From big. Okay. Now, basically, this this I find very interesting. The uh, is uh, this is an image uh, sketched by somebody uh, called Gordon Sanderson around 1912, 13. Uh, which is trying to imagine what if Qutub Minar was a power station. Uh, and, and it intrigued me because I, I didn't know that at around that time, there was somebody who was wondering what would happen to Delhi uh, if this were to be the case. Uh, so you now you can see what is, uh, sorry, let me go back. Where do we go back? Yeah, so this is what has happened to Delhi today, uh, which is, you know, the pollution that you see every day. So that's one kind of, of kind of uh, image that I wanted to show. Uh, I also wanted to suggest to you that there are many different uh, spheres or, or sites that these things happen. It can be a formal setting, like this is a power station in Bombay, uh, again, in, in, the, in the colonial period. And so uh, you could have a formal modern industry like this, or you could have uh, a, a more uh, uh, a more uh, informal setting. Uh, I don't know if you can read behind this text, but there is this person who's, who's kind of has a small little uh, chula on which uh, you know he's cooking something. And you can see a lot of smoke coming out. The text below is interesting for me because it talks of all three things. It talks about waste, it talks about health, and it talks. It doesn't talk about economy so much, but. Uh, uh, about aesthetics so much, but it does talk about waste and health. Why talking about this poor guy who's trying to, you know, his street vendor trying to sell something. So again, the settings can be both formal and informal and, and uh, this we have to take account of. This is something that, that worries me the most in policy thinking, which is much of what we do is after the fact, uh, which is uh, build these kind of things in the hope, and now we have smoke towers and things like that, in the hope that things will improve. Uh, of course, some improvement must be happening. I'm not very really sure what the data is on that. Uh, but the, my concern is how do we do the more difficult task of the preceding act, which causes the difficulty in the first place? How do we think about those things? How do we think about our transport? How do we think about our housing? <coughs> If I'm not incorrect, much of the urban housing that India needs, and Dr. Rumi could correct me on that, is yet to be built, which means we have a huge opportunity to rethink how we build in order that we don't cause the problems that we end up causing. Uh, similarly, transport redesigning has to happen. So one of the things that, that we, we could do far better uh, is, is to think in advance, especially where there's an opportunity, uh, such as, for example, new urban housing. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity there to think differently, think uh, with different kinds of materials, with different design, 
in order that we can build better so that we have fewer problems in hand later. So those, those are the images that I wanted to share with you. Uh, okay, uh, so let me, let me stop there. What do you uh, Yes, uh, that was a very fascinating, interesting uh, talk by Professor Sharan. Uh, and uh, while I was li listening and all of us were listening to the talk, uh, we were all uh, thinking about the fact that today's policymakers, planners are trying to deal with many of the issues that have been pointed out in the talk. Uh, the, the point on uh, the importance given to, to small, small things in historical times about air quality, uh, somewhere uh, either we have forgotten, we are not giving enough importance, or as the distinguished speaker has mentioned rightly, that we are not prioritizing things. Uh, so, so more work is needed in this in this regard. Uh, this uh, another important uh, point that that I feel uh, is 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 significant is is about the integrated approach and the inclusive approach that Professor Sharon referred to. Uh, although when uh, all of us, when we study uh, the, the approach or the strategies that have been formulated by the uh, government of India in their various uh, missions or programs or schemes, uh, inclusion and integration is mentioned, uh, but to what extent this is being practiced is, is questionable and uh, there is no follow up on, on uh, how much inclusion and integration has actually gone into uh, when projects or schemes are implemented. So that is an equally important point for uh, when we talk on subjects like uh, air quality or water quality and, and other urban sectors. Uh, I also like the point on uh, the fact that uh, this topic of environment, in this case, but even other sectors like mobility or water sanitation, uh, change begins at home. Uh, this is extremely relevant. Each one of us has a responsibility uh, to, to, to operate, to behave in a certain manner. Uh, when people talk about uh, a disciplined city, it is this that is, is uh, very important. It is in, in, to, to a great extent in our hands uh, to, to define or to shape our city. So, so this point on change begins at home and changes can occur at different levels uh, is, is a very important point. Unfortunately, in the case of India, I, uh, and you will all agree with me, uh, that uh, uh, our standard of living and the quality of life and the economic condition is such uh, that uh, the people are not able to respond to what the government would like them to do. Uh, they, they have their own set of worries. Uh, they are poor. Uh, they, you would want them to behave in a certain manner in, in so far as disposal of waste is concerned. But, but they have other priorities and worries on their mind. And uh, I strongly feel that unless there is some kind of a major push towards an upliftment of such sections of the population, the kind of... Uh, expectations that people have uh, as to how their cities should be like would be very difficult to achieve. Uh, the other point I liked in this talk is about the, I'm happy that uh, Professor Sharon mentioned about, about planning for Indian cities or planning of Indian cities. Uh, being educated in, in planning, uh, 
I think uh, a lot, and I often give equal importance or weightage to, to how much effort has been made in the planning process, uh, or I would say 50% weightage to, to planning and 50% to all the other aspects, because planning involves uh, participation of a diverse range of stakeholders and taking decisions on how things should be like when uh, a certain idea is implemented on the ground. So that, 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 that's a very important point that has been nicely brought out by the uh, speaker. And uh, I'm sure we are all aware about uh, the most recent development in this case about the master plan for Delhi uh, for the period 2021 to 2041, wherein uh, a lot of emphasis, at least on paper, has been laid on inclusive planning, involvement of communities, involvement of a wide range of stakeholders, holding consultations, the kind of challenges that are being experienced in this process, uh, the, the gray areas in, in, in the approach that has been adopted. Uh, so so that, that's a very important point. And the final thing is about uh, the mismatch between uh, patterns and practices that exist and the, and the work that the government is doing uh, without taking into account these patterns and practices. Very often things are being done without a proper understanding of uh, how things should be or what people require. Uh, so, so unless uh, this mismatch is addressed properly, uh, the, the requirements and the kind of environment that one is looking forward to uh, will never be shaped. Uh, so overall, my impressions on the talk are, are, are very good, very impressive uh, talk. And to, to learn more about, uh, about this topic and to get inputs from, from our distinguished panel of uh, discussants, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ravi Kant Joshi, if Dr. Joshi is present in today's uh, program. Uh, Dr. Joshi is a consultant, urban finance and governance. Uh, and uh, I have heard a lot about him. I've come across a lot of uh, excellent articles on, on the subject of urban governance and finance. And uh, it would be interesting to hear his views as to uh, what are his impressions on, on Indian cities and uh, what needs to be done insofar as uh, the, the financial and governance related aspects are concerned for, for bringing about a change that everybody is looking for. Uh, Dr. Joshi, over to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Professor Sharan's presentation, some of the beautiful points which um, uh, Professor uh, Rumiji has uh, covered. So I won't repeat that. I would compliment two, three things. As he rightly pointed out, that still those houses are yet to be built. And same is the case with the, our cities. We have more than 4,500 cities. Out of that, if we leave 60 million plus cities, there are another 60 or 70 cities which are on verge of becoming million plus. That is uh, 5 lakh to 10 lakh category. And then there are another 300 or 350 cities which are from over 1 lakh population. So if, in fact, I really agree that climate change and addressing the climate change, the road goes through the urban. Now, here is a big problem for India. He has mentioned other problems for South cities, but with India, it is now going to be a urban explosion. We were at a takeoff stage in 2011. And as per all estimates by 2030, we'll have 600 million people staying in urban. So on one side, uh, we have to address our cities, if at all we want to be effective in climate change. I'm not talking from world context. In other developed countries, already urbanization has taken place. So only they have to become carbon neutral. Their urbanization is not going to grow of the developed world. But issue with the India is that our urbanization 
is going to grow at a much faster space in coming 10 years. And by 2050, almost we will reach to the 66 to 70 percent of our population, whatever it means that. And it could be around 800 million. So the uh, point is that India has a double whammy. On one side, its approaches need to change while addressing the environmental concern, but it is going to face unprecedented urbanization explosion. And its cities, which are at the moment small, they are going to grow. That is this second set, as I said, uh, 70 cities, 70, 75 cities, which are between 5 lakh to 10 lakh people. And actually, there is no hap nothing on planning side. In fact, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rumi will agree that, in fact, we haven't done master plan for our all cities even. We haven't planned our cities. We haven't thought uh, the climate change and other aspects for these 5 lakh to 10 lakh cities and then the other cities which will be joining. So one on one side, population explosion will be happening. And I would like to complement uh, the point which Professor Sharan was bringing, that the social aspect and how we change the behavioral aspect of the people. So we required massive, massive uh, uh, public education in adopting the climate friendly or ca carbon neutral practices in our daily life. Even uh, Dr. Rumi mentioned that it should start with us. And that would require a big mass campaign uh, to change the societal behavior and behavior of the urban people, because we are going to have a big urbanization problem. So meeting the climate change targets would depend upon how we address our cities. Two, three points I will just relate, as he rightly said, aesthetic aspect. It is still ruling. Look at the Swachh Bharat mission. What was the scheme to taking away the garbage outside the city? The treatment of the garbage was left. And uh, the, now the new uh, Swachh Bharat mission two is coming in that we will be addressing the sewage uh, treatment and then uh, solid waste uh, treatment. In last seven years, it was a morely aesthetic aspect which prevailed. What arrangement we created instead of going for zero waste technologies, people doing composting and all that, we are extending our resources for door to door collection, which is not wrong thing. It's a good thing. We are collecting door to door garbage where we have moved well or containment or stopping the open defecation and containment of the sludge. But then what about the treatment of the sludge, fecal sludge? So that is just taken away from the city. So aesthetic aspect is still ruling high. I liked his point. I only just wanted to add, uh, just mention this, that our recent design of the missions are still not capturing the climate change, uh, that thing. And the third point I would like to mention, very recently 15 Central Finance Commission has provided in million plus cities, 50 million metropolitan areas, 50% of the money given to the ULBs for air pollution control and pollution control. I am seeing a mismatch in governance terms, which point uh, uh, Dr. Rumi brought in. See, the money which is given is rightly for air pollution, but air pollution control is not in the hands of the local bodies. So 15 Central Finance Commission and Government of India could have very well addressed that money in other aspect where it goes to the Ministry of Environment. Showing the money in the pockets of the urban local bodies but giving it to the Ministry of Environment, while municipal bodies even doesn't have vehicular pollution in their hand. What municipal bodies have is a water pollution which they can stop, but not even again, water pollution means whatever sewage is generated, that is left untreated, leading to the city uh, rivers and the lakes polluted. That really comes in the hands of the urban local bodies. Air pollution is not a subject of the local bodies. Not single act or nothing has empowers local bodies. So no doubt about that money should be given for air pollution, but it should not be shown in the uh, urban local bodies grant and then taking away from there and handing over to this. And that will be implemented by the either police department and the pollution control boards. Directly that money could have been given for the pollution control board and money should have been given to achieve 100 per se sewage treatment, linking it, because that is the real thing, which is, so there is a mismatch between the flow of the funds and the government. I would stop here. I must congratulate Impari and Professor Saran for uh, illuminating us and really brought those historical angles 
And the very most important point that uh, the technology is an answer, but before that, the humans, we all who use that technology, really have an uh, answer for the climate change by ch changing the behavioral aspects of our life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Joshi. That was very enlightening, uh, particularly your reminder uh, to all of us about the urgency for putting the act together quickly as India urbanizes. Uh, you have rightly mentioned that there's a lot of urbanization in the times to come, and uh, we need to put things in proper order and to prepare accordingly. So that was uh, a very uh, good talk and inputs from your side. Uh, I would like to uh, move ahead in the program and uh, invite Professor R.B. Bhagat, uh, who is at the Department of Migration and Urban Studies at the International Institute for po Population Sciences in Mumbai, uh, to share his idea and views uh, on the subject of today's discussion. Uh, Professor Bhagat. Thank you. Is it, am I audible? You are very much. Am we I can audible? hear you. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. okay. Clearly, so loud thank and clear. You, Rumi. Uh, thank you, Rumi. And uh, nice meeting you after a long time. Okay. So uh, it was nice listening, uh, Professor Saran, and the detailed accounts of environmental degradation, in general, air pollution, water pollution, et cetera, I think. Uh, we have, and he rightly uh, pointed out what are the challenges of urban transformation. Uh, urban is important, urbanization is important, as you know, but there are huge challenges of urban transformation that he has alluded to. My thinking is that what is alternative imagination? What is our alternative urban imagination? And that matters because we have to see how to rebuild city. And generally what the till now that we have discussed, there are technological solutions, there are behavioral solutions. But as Professor Saran has rightly said, that whenever a meeting is organized and when he goes, and I also have similar type of situation, you will find that the technocrats and the scientists, they are dominating, of course, experts. And so this type of a imagination is dominating where the alternative imagination of the city, alternative voice, is getting marginalized. So this is a big question. It is not a simple one. And these problems are not simply technological and behavioral, but there are structural problems and we have to incorporate to make it integrated way to understand it. And therefore the question is very important. Who is producing air pollution? Who is producing environmental degradation in the city? That is very important question. And environmental degradation in the city cannot be understood without understanding built environment. And when I say built environment, and when we look at city, city is simply the expansion of built environment. But what is built environment? Built in entire built environment, whether you take uh, housing, real estate, flyover, uh, to big towers, these are the symbols of, or these are the repository of wealth. So therefore, built environment creating wealth. And we must see air pollution, environmental degradation in trade off with GDP. So air pollution is not simply air pollution, which we see, but it symbolizes and represents the GDP of the country. I think we have to see deeper into these structural aspects. And then we have to have a very alternative urban imagination that should also bring on the agenda. And in that respect, I appreciate city in one or two respects that city represents diversity. You will not find a city and a bigger city 
without diversity, whether you take New York or you take Paris or Mumbai, this represents city, diversity. And diversity, and we look at history, cities have been the centers of civilization and where citizens were produced. And therefore, the understanding of democracy is very important, how the cities are getting democratic, urban democracy. I think we are uh, missing urban democracy we have more centralization. Uh, our uh, development authorities are created. A smart city, we have special purpose vehicles. And then citizens getting marginalized. And there's no planning. We have projects, projects driven city. And say, rightly, uh, uh, Dr. Joshi has said that, yes, planning is very important. But planning getting uh, disappeared. And the citizens' role, now experts dominating the whole scene. So I think urban democracy is very critical. Decentralization and planning, I think very important. And that is a political question of center, state relationship, and state and local body. State also doesn't want to grant uh, autonomy to the local bodies as per 74th Amendment to the Constitution. We have about 30 years of, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, gone down the years, 30 years, but we have not been able to fully implement 74th Amendment to the Constitution. So I think with these remarks, I will stop because time allotted to me was just five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Professor R.P. Bhagat. That was, it was very good to listen to your comments and views on uh, Professor Sharon's presentation. Uh, and uh, the, the point that you mentioned about alternative urban imagination uh, is, is extremely relevant. It's very important. Um, often I think about, and we all think about uh, this, this aspect in the context of pollution, I have noted that uh, the kind of a chaos has been created by the human practices, uh, the faulty practices that people are engaged in and uh, more alternatives are needed. When alternatives are not provided, people will continue to wish to, to operate in the manner they would wish to. Uh, and uh, if suitable alternatives based on uh, the, the conditions that prevail within a certain context, either it is related to the use of generator sets in commercial areas, or it's related to mobility. Uh, have we thought of uh, proper environmental friendly, people friendly, affordable alternatives, whether it's related to uh, the, the crop fires that we experience year after year in the Delhi region. Uh, so, so I think uh, your point about alternative urban imagination uh, is, is, uh, is very significant in that respect. Uh, and, and also the other points that you mentioned. Uh, once again, thank you uh, for your inputs. Uh, I would move on in this program and invite Professor Gopa Samantha uh, who is at the Department of Geography at the University of Burdwan in West Bengal. Uh, Professor uh, Samantha, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this panel. And uh, I'm a keen uh, follower of Professor Staran's work since uh, he wrote the book uh, In the City Out of Place because that time I was working on Android environment, but uh, especially from the uh, idea of how water was imagined and how water was planned in earlier period. Uh, so basically it was water history. And uh, today also I learned a lot and it was a wonderful experience to listen to Professor Saran. What I'm trying to point out that uh, the urban environmental history itself has become so important to understand our cities that we cannot deny the contribution of historians in the field of city and urban environment. 
because al although we know that even the environmental dialogue within the discipline of history is like you know mobi led and it was 1980s and 19 uh, 1980s and 90s only we we have that dialogue on environment but that is so much crucial in understanding the present environmental condition that we need to uh, understand more and more the history because that then only we know that what mistakes we have done already and if we do not understand or appreciate our mistakes as pointed by the historians then it is very difficult that we can think about a policy to correct our understanding to correct our policy or the right approach you are looking for it's absolutely going to be very very difficult for us so i'm very much thankful to professor saran and all other urban historians who are contributing in the urban environmental field itself so i was thinking that yes um professor saran has already pointed out three perspectives like aesthetics um, health and relocation yes we know that health became a very important factor even if we think about like you know um, planning of london or planning of paris where from this whole urban planning has come out it was because of the sanitation was a big issue when london and paris started to plan uh, in their own way to to remove things and this relocation is absolutely linked to which the planning is conceived in 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 different different parts of the world in every city so i'm also very much uh, reluctant to think that planning can take care of urban environment because to my understanding planning itself a very exclusionary process it emphasizes aesthetics it emphasizes unwanted things to the cities like poor and slums and poverty and many other things so i do not uh, believe in that idea that planning can take care of urban environment and also i want to add to the factor that yes it is true that even when uh, when uh, i think about calcutta itself so the colonial legacy uh, as as professor sarn has already pointed out even before in his book that that legacy of how do we see the environment because itself the indian context was so much different from that uh, which was conceptualized by the british uh, themselves so it was like you know they were uh, because it was a malaria break up of break out of malaria in kolkata and kolkata was full of ponds so to get rid of of the mosquitoes and malaria they started filling ponds and this pattern is also con being continued today even in every city in west bengal especially where there are a lot of ponds around but this is not because of the malaria then it is because of the real estate and promoter and political economy so people all all these these uh, ponds are being filled up and because of a different reason but that the culture the culture of filling up the pond uh, so that might have a legacy but the context has become different now so that is also a very important factor for us to understand and i was also thinking that what we think about urban environment these days especially in india it's very very contingent you know we have a air pollution okay delhi february and and winter we have to we have to do something but we have to understand that urban environment we cannot actually when we think about urban environment we cannot think about a boundary itself because if i if i may uh, refer dinesh mohan Uh, who passed away recently the emeritus professor of iit delhi so they is often used to say that okay we want a eco friendly transport like metro in delhi but we have to think where from the power used by the metro rail is coming somewhere in the countryside we are burning fossil fuels we are burning coal to get that power so energy and urban urban is also the cities are also there is a highest level of consumption of resources but i would also like to add that if we think that consumption pattern is really low in rural india 
this is not the reality. One of my students is working on the idea of how the consumption pattern of urban middle class and rural middle class are different. And we are seeing that they're almost matching the level of energy consumption of urban middle class household and the rural middle class household, or maybe the upper class, we can say in the rural areas, is almost the same. And so we cannot only think that, okay, 23 to 30% population are living in urban areas. And that's why we think about when we think about the environment and energy crisis and the pollution and, and whatever the resultant phenomena of those uh, resource uses, it's not only within the urban territory. If we think about water itself, like Delhi, where from the water of Delhi is coming in this world? No city in, in India is, um, is independent of their regional territory for extracting the water itself. So when I think about urban, this is also problematic of thinking city environment as completely different or cut off from the rural areas or the regional or local scale. So as Professor Saran has pointed out, when we think about environment, we have to think about the scale, but scale of local and global or planetary. And that local is not within the territory of a city. That local is extended beyond the territory of a city. It is always, you know, uh, it, it's about even about the pollution factor. As Saran has pointed out that we are relocating things. We do not want um, slums within cities. So we want to push them a little bit farther somewhere out like you know before the commonwealth games in delhi what happened like you know cleaning of streets and flyovers so we we try to move uh, things which we do not want within the city and it is not only a aesthetics point of view it has a huge other patterns of how we conceptualize our cities because we are now in india we are determined to conceptualize our cities as world class that's a big problem. That's a problem of how we conceptualize because we cannot compare Delhi with London or Paris because of the population itself, the, 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 the poor and underprivileged. So if we think that first we have to clarify the point that what would be the city we, we want to see them. Is that only for the middle class gated community, towers located far away uh, within the suburban areas, out from the congested part of the inner city areas? Is that our model? Probably we have to rethink that we cannot spread our cities too much because of the transport and environment, the fuel consumption and the travel time, commute time. We have to think about more condensed cities or dense cities these days. But we are actually, what we are doing, we are just going in the opposite direction. We are destroying rivers, we are destroying marshy lands, we are destroying wetlands, and we are destroying things and we are building cities and we are extending cities more and more so that we use more fuel, more commute time and et cetera. So that is also a very important factor and we have to think that in thinking about urban environment cannot be on a project basis like you know uh, like such Bharat program or maybe the green city program and what i think that when we conceptualize india we conceptualize smart cities as uh, as eco friendly but think about everything is digital if it is everything digital so think about how much energy consumption is going to be uh, for for the smart cities and it's going to be huge. And definitely we won't have a thermal point power plant in smart cities, but somewhere else. So again, out somewhere. And that out is a problem. And if we, if we don't think that environment cannot be, we, if we think about the city environment, we cannot think about only the territories within the boundary lines of municipal corporation or municipality, then it's very, very misleading. And lastly, I would like to point out that 
that yes, if we think about environment, we need more social scientists. We need more uh, environmental historians like Professor Sharon, and, and there are many also in India. Many people are working, even the uh, environmental historians. So they can only tell, like, we need the technology people, we need the engineers, but the engineers need to talk to the environmental historian who can make them aware of the fact that what mistakes has already been done by the technicians. So that is very, very important in, in, in case of not only urban environment, any urban env any environmental dialogue we make, we need a conversation between the science and technology, technology persons and the social scientists and historians in the most cases. So that is, uh, I think I should stop. I have spoken. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Samantha, for for your points, for your inputs. Uh, these are uh, these are very good, uh, and uh, the the comment that you made about uh, that uh, many of us or or those who work in the government uh, very often uh, they they quite often tend to forget uh, the historical experience. Uh, is, is an important one because uh, when you look at these programs or schemes or missions designed by the government of India, uh, there is very little reference to uh, how have these fared urban development programs or programs related to environment fared in the past. And uh, new ideas are, are brought in without adequate understanding of uh, what the character of cities display uh, and and the examples that you gave about about the ponds in kolkata uh, is absolutely correct and true uh, this uh, this observation uh, also exists in in other cities of india uh, where uh, water bodies uh, on which uh, bird and animal life is dependent upon is is being change those uh, those depressions natural depressions are being filled uh, at the cost of uh, new development uh, which is disturbing the ecosystem uh, this is not uh, the best way uh, to 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 transform uh, the 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 life in in indian cities and and uh, the point you mentioned about uh, dense uh, need for compact dense cities uh, there is slightly change in thinking about this after the uh, occurrence of the pandemic and uh, you would know about it that uh, previously before this problem uh, when uh, smart plans and and other initiatives were being developed uh, and also in other parts of the world, not only in India, there was a uh, tendency towards creating compact smart cities. It, it does address many of the issues of resources that you spoke about, uh, the, the length of pipelines, et cetera, uh, and, the, and the distances that people are traveling over uh, for a long time, they, they, they take a long time. and and the amount of consumption of resources that are happening or occurring in this process. Um, after the occurrence of uh, the pandemic, uh, the, the planning community is, is going back to the previous idea of, of sparse planning or developing sparse cities. Uh, things are further away from each other so that when in a problem such as a pandemic, pandemic occurs, there is a uh, minimum chance of, of a large population by uh, being affected by, by, by this problem. So uh, it's a very, things are in a very confusing state, I would say. There is little clarity and you've rightly brought out some of the, the gray areas, the issues uh, that exist, uh, some of the wrong things that are happening in the country about on which more thinking and more action is required. So I thank you 
for your thoughts and comments. Uh, it was wonderful to listen to, to your, your ideas. Uh, thank you. And now I would like to move to uh, the next and final discussant in today's program, uh, Professor V.P. Sati, who, who, who is professor at the Department of Geography and Resource Management uh, at Mizoram University. We all know uh, the, the conditions or the characteristics in northeastern parts of the country is much different from, from where we all are living. And uh, it would be interesting to hear some fresh thoughts, some ideas as to uh, what are the similarities uh, that one should look for and what are uh, the potential threats uh, that could, could, could one experience uh, and I have not been given enough importance uh, when one talks about the environment in cities. Over to you, Professor Sati. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rumi. Uh, I, after a long time, we could see each other only by webinar. So anyway, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, there is some problem. Yeah, now it has come. So uh, uh, I'm going to make a a small case study of the Radun city. So you will find also a different uh, issues because the Radun is a, a mountain city. I will, I will connect all these issues that, that were raised by Professor Saran regarding the city and environment. Um, uh, why I'm taking the Radun as in this uh, small case study because uh, Dehradun is a mountainous uh, city and it has very limited space to expand uh, and there are some many, many issues to be discussed. One important thing that I want to tell you that after the, you know, that Uttarakhand got a statehood in 2000, uh, all people uh, from the rural areas, they rushed to Dehradun and they, uh, they purchased plots and constructed their buildings. So there was a large scale immigration during this uh, last two decades. And as a result of this uh, immigration in a very small city, because as I will give you example that uh, uh, Dehradun, uh, the population of Dehradun before 2001 was only about four lakh. And uh, in 2011, the population was more than 12 lakh. So that jumped. And the growth rate was 20, 39.9% decadal growth rate. That much population increased due to the immigration, one of the major um, this driving force that increased the uh, population of Dehradun. And at the same time, you see that out of this total 29.9% growth rate, more than 50% are immigrants. They have uh, uh, settled in Dehradun. And that's why the Dehradun, Dehradun is a district, uh, it is also a mountainous district, but there are a small place, a small space where the, 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 uh, this Dehradun district is plain. So in this mountainous district also, 55.9% uh, people living in the urban area. So in a small area, a huge population is living. So what happened that after this, after this um, uh, large scale immigration in Dehradun, there were 113 slums emerged. And out of which, 90 slums, they were emerged along the two very important streams. Both streams, they are uh, passing through the core area of the city. And uh, it is very important to note also that uh, the, the name of the stream, Rishi Parna, after the Rishi Parna, because he financed there, and very pure uh, river. But again, you see that governance point of this, Governance point in this uh, uh, is to uh, uh, the government wanted to regenerate these, these streams because lots of slums and lots of garbage dumping in this area. 
they wanted to regenerate but at the same time now recently the government has made one garbage dump area along the rishi parna river in the core part of dehradun so all the garbage is coming from the households and they are dumping first in on the bank of the rishi parna and they have planted lots of uh, the plants along the rishi parna but at the same time this is the, this is the point that i am raising about the governance and uh, uh and both rivers are now very polluted poly, very polluted earlier dehradun was one of the very beautiful city and uh, the other source the second thing is, is that the shrinking agriculture land in a very small area there was very good agriculture land earlier in dehradun and there were basmati rice grown and it is also it was exported because it was a very high quality now you will find no agriculture land within the city periphery city and its periphery and um, uh, uh, on the other hand that all city has become a concrete jungle that is up to that it is okay but one very important thing that is now coming now in dehradun is that the vertical expansion of the city multi story building and also when we talk about the multi story buildings the you know that the the basic basic thing that we are now not looking into dehradun is very close to the main thrust main the central thrust that is the wall that earthquake job earthquake thrust very close to this main thrust uh, central thrust and also dehradun comes under the john fifth earthquake joining map that is very important to understand what government did actually first government has given the permission to these uh, builders to build up to seven stories building and immediately some pressure was there from the builders and they allowed to make to, to construct up to eight stories that is again issue and then they are not following the standard because this is very very uh, earthquake prone area and lots of problem may come because as the scientists they have already predicted that in future anything uh, happens in terms of the tectonic moves seismic moves it will be between delhi and dehradun that point we have to understand actually while we are talking about the city city scape and environment because it will have very very big problem in the time time to come so and then actually when there was a large scale uh, I, I, uh, this uh, uh, population growth uh, i i have some data that 100% vehicle increase during this last uh, this uh, decade 100% increase and what happened dehradun had uh, 90 39 degree centigrade average temperature during the summer now it has gone to 44 degree centigrade that data it is real data and the, uh, the at the ground point and then what happened again is what uh, thing that i want to uh, tell you that we are talking about smart city and dehradun is one of the city that is also given the tag of smart city that we have to develop but you know that after 2000 one when there was large scale immigration the settlements they were constructed more haphazardly than the settlements constructed before 2000 so then again problem if you go to the old city it is well uh, planned and it is now even today also no problem but if you go to the new uh, this settlement areas urban areas you will find so haphazard and also Uh, because in the name of the smart city what they are doing is that they are digging out the this uh, damar only and also filling the damar with the this tiles so that much so there is not much planning also that i am talking about governance and because dehradun has very limited space it is surrounded by rajaji national park and also the mountain area so space is limited so even you want to make the dehradun smart city where is the space and where will the people go and slums are increasing very abruptly like this so 
these are some issues uh, because uh, time is very limited. I wanted to present this actually, but then I just dropped my thought because the time was so limited. And then my, I, what I have seen also, if you go to Dehradun, a very beautiful city, but even uh, if you go to the railway station to bus stand, there is not a single uh, urinal or toilet. So that as usual, as in India, the people, they do whatever they want on the, and no dustbin is keeping their uh, on the road side or on other side. So if you go at the noon time also, it is all dirty all along. And in the core areas also, these are very core issues that we have to take into because we are talking about a small, a small city and we have not a single urinal, even in two, three kilometer uh, area. So where people will go. So these are something, something that I wanted to um, present. And then my some suggestion is that uh, we need some planning and uh, we have to the, think about that even the immigration is there. Large scale immigration is continued there. So we have to think about that, not only the development of the urban areas, we have to think about the development of the rural areas, then urban area may be more safe. The amenities, the facilities we have to give to the rural areas that that way we can save our this um, um, uh, rural the urban area we can save when we can give the all facilities or some to certain extent to the rural in the rural area so we have what we have to manage this actually the garbage management is a big problem and then uh, if we have we have also we are giving example and also, yes, you, we know that we're comparing the, the cities abroad and India. So that way we have to develop the amenities and we need to proper, uh, you know, that uh, management of garbage also. And uh, uh, community particip participation in this way is very, very important. Those people living in that city, they have to also come out because everything government not come. So, and we are also the polluter because we don't think also because and the other on the other hand that we don't have the facility so both way these are the some special things also and we there was some discussion on the slum areas also definitely we need to uh, we need to shift these uh, slum dwellers to in the city but we have to give all facilities to them i have one example of uh, this china during uh, 1990s there was one colony, slum colony. So the government wanted to shift that slum colony into other places, but the people, they told, no, we cannot go unless you provide us some uh, something. So then government has first constructed building for them. And then after uh, giving them all facilities, then they asked them to shift your, uh, this uh, um, slum area to that building. And then China, you can see that urbanization and all respect lots of development is there. But we cannot simply just throw them away. We have to give them within the periphery of the city. Vertical expansion is only the way in, in Dehradun, but we have to see that the vulnerability. And then when we construct the building, construction of building is very, very important. So that standard we must have for the city regions. And uh, I will not take much time. I think I have taken lots of time. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sati. I think it was it was fascinating to listen to the Dehradun experience that you just shared with all of us. I think it is a good way of uh, uh, it helps a lot in 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 understanding and, and your simple words and, and examples that you gave about, about the disposal of waste. It was very all, all very understandable. It was a very simple words that you put in and uh, uh, the, the points you spoke about, the, the, the negative consequences of urbanization in Dehradun, uh, the, 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 the violations that are occurring. And your point about violations, and especially in the context of today's lecture or talk by Professor Sharan is, is extremely relevant. It is true, Delhi is also uh, among the, at high risk of, of earthquakes, et cetera. 
uh, and uh, how much attention is being paid in that regard uh, is something for all of us to think about. Uh, very often we we just go along with uh, with the with, with 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 the manner in which the whole world is going. Uh, very high rise buildings without thinking of the precautions that uh, one needs to take uh, in pursuing such development. Uh, you are right about about your experience that you shared about China. Uh, there's a lot of criticism about China, but China has uh, many uh, things to offer to the world. Uh, uh, they, they too have learned uh, from the West and from other nations, and they have done a lot of uh, experimentation on their own about, uh, about how to uh, accommodate uh, the working population. Uh, during my course of visits to China, I learned a lot about, about uh, the, the, the problems that the working community is facing there insofar as their rights are concerned. Uh, and uh, on which uh, several scholars are working to, to address that issue. Uh, but I think uh, it was uh, a wonderful uh, uh, contribution from your side about the experience of Dehradun. So, so on behalf of all of us, we thank you for participating and giving your inputs. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Now is the time for us to, to go back to our distinguished speaker. I hope uh, we have not gone, all of us have not gone too way off of what you covered in your presentation. Uh, it's, it's a vast subject. It's a very vast subject. And as you rightly said in your talk about uh, looking at it holistically, looking at very, various aspects of environment, and looking at it in an integrated manner. Uh, I hope uh, the inputs offered by the distinguished panel of discussants uh, were of some use to you, and uh, you may like to, uh, to, to share your views on what you just have heard from the discussants. Over to you, Professor Sharan. Well, th thank you. Uh, thank you to all the discussants. Uh, there's a lot uh, that's on the plate. Uh, I don't think I can do justice to all your comments. Let me just organize my thoughts uh, uh, somewhat uh, starting with Professor Sati. Uh, see, one of the things uh, about this whole planning business uh, is uh, to the extent that I know it, uh, there is often an assumption that we know the problems. Uh, we also possibly know the solutions. Uh, and the trick in India is how do we implement the solutions that we have in mind. So the real problem as far as policy is concerned is how to implement something. And this is something one hears over and over again in different contexts. Now, what all of you have suggested, when I hope uh, I try to suggest in my own way, is that we need far more thinking about what our issues are uh, and the ways in which we approach those issues, whether those are issues of governance, uh, whether those are issues about transformation in land use and, and use of water bodies, or whether they are about how do we deal with our garbage. Uh, it's not as if we know everything about it and all that we have to do is find the right way to implement it. And all of you in different ways have suggested uh, Professor Gopa's point about uh, the fact for a regional approach is, is well taken. Uh, there's no way that any city can deal with its issues only within municipal limits. So there's a lot uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's been very useful and useful learning for me, certainly. Uh, hearing you, uh, Dr. Joshi, on, on the mismatch in financial allocations, etc. The question is, and this is, I don't want to sound cheeky about this, but, but when the problems are huge, uh, it's an exciting time to be a researcher. Uh, because you can the more difficult it is to live 
the more exciting it should be to do research uh, because uh, because new questions are being put to you and um, pre-COVID, uh, we knew historically there have been pandemics, but who cared about it? It's been gone for some time, at least for about a century, and you didn't quite care about it. So, so you are reminded of, of, of older issues, newer issues that come up. I wanted to respond very quickly, taking Professor Bhagat's uh, plea for an alternative thinking uh, about cities. And I think there are four or five different dimensions to this alternative thinking that uh, all of us can profit from. And very quickly, let me just say what I think uh, works for me. There's very obviously a social dimension. All of us know this, feel this, experience it. It has to do with uh, issues of gender. Uh, it has to do with issues of class. And so we have to ask, who do we build our cities for? Uh, do we build it only for the middle class? Do we also build it for the workers who work in the city? Do we also build it for the artists who give creative inputs? So there's, there are those questions about social issues. Uh, of course, as we all know, the one social issue that's come under tremendous strain in recent times is the ability of people of different faiths to live together in, in urban settings. It's come under tremendous strain. It's something that should worry all of us uh, as to how we are going to cope with this issue. So there are these social issues in thinking about alternative cities, alternative spaces. Uh, there is very clearly, as Professor Bhagat also mentioned, the political issue. Are you going to do this in a democratic way? Are we going to build more authoritarian spaces? Are we going to build only expert-led cities? Or is there going to be civic participation? So the questions about political issues. Uh, there are also technical issues that we don't pay as much attention to. Uh, which have to do with what are new design ideas? What are the new materials that we're working with? What is the input that engineers and architects are giving into new materials that we can use that cause less damage, new design patterns that we can, uh, we can come up with, which are more useful uh, in terms of conserving resources or making better use of space, et cetera. And finally, there's this whole environmental dimension that I talked about. Uh, in which we have to think not only about uh, different classes of human beings, but also humans and non-human species, uh, animals, and maybe in the last instance, even about dead matter, because it is, it is the dead matter and the resources that we use uh, that give shape to the particular urban forms that we have. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot to think and work with. Uh, I personally find it hugely exciting time to research on urban issues. And I hope uh, uh, I've been able to suggest to you uh, some of the questions that I have personally found interesting. And certainly there are a lot many that you have put on the plate, which are very useful and, and good to learn from. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sharan, for your response. Uh, Dr. Arjun, do we have some questions? Uh, would anybody like to ask if there are participants in this program? Is there a question for a certain panelist or uh, one of the panelists? So there are some questions on Q&A, but I guess um, Professor Sharon has touched all of them. All of them? Okay. <clears throat> all of them in his remarks. And uh, one question uh, which Professor Ajit Shashadri sir is asking that we always have a gloomy scenes in all our cities. Can we have a few role model ideal cities to replicate? Panel may advise. So this is one question. And with that, we can say also move to way forward round. One, one minute to each panelist. And then you can, can I just start. take one minute more? If you don't yes. mind. There Please. is a comment about gender that I did want to speak about. Uh, yeah. And it is, it is uh, rightly said in that comment that there's no way that we can ignore it. Uh, and there's a lot of... Uh, thinking that has happened around it. One issue that particularly fascinates me at this point is how in, in COVID times, the nature of work has changed and is changing and what implications does it have for uh, gender relations. Uh, and there's some very interesting studies coming out on how working from home, uh, having that relevant technology, but not having that space, which you can claim or own in a particular way, has very clear gender dimensions to it. Uh, there's a way in which coming out of home was a sign of freedom 
having to force to go back to homes to work. Uh, what does it say? And there are a lot of very, very important, interesting questions to be asked about on, on questions of security. You know, Delhi government pushes CCTV cameras. It doesn't even uh, bother to ask or we don't push enough on our rights and claims upon the streets for men and women, for young and old. And I think therefore these are very, very important questions. Uh, cities are spaces that are deeply marked by, by gender relations. I spoke of people of different faith. I worry a lot on that count also, whether our cities have become too strained and find too little space for that. But we have to keep working in order to create uh, more, more inclusive cities. Uh, so I didn't want to address that question. Thank you, Professor Sharan, for your additional inputs. Uh, may I ask uh, or request Dr. Joshi to, 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 to say or give his concluding remark? Uh, we are moving towards the end of the program. And if Dr. Joshi is, is still with us, uh, if there are any concluding remarks from your side. Sir, some issues we can move to next. Okay. Uh, Professor Bhagat is, is with us. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rumi. Uh, huh? I think anything you I... wish to add to, to, the, to the discussion okay, okay. today? Thank you. Nothing, nothing to add more, but just to thank Professor Saran uh, for nice exposition and uh, his thoughts uh, as a reply. I think uh, we all have been benefited through this rich discussion. And uh, I like to repeat that uh, there is a need to build a voice and also collective action. And that is very, very important for our ur alternative urban Im imagination and building a society, urban society better. Because our future is tied with urban. We cannot bypass urban because urbanization is something which is creation of, uh, of talent, innovation, relationship, all these are there, but it has gone in a wrong way. We have to, we should make it right. And that is my humble sub, uh, submission. Uh, we must have voice and collective action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhagat. Uh, Professor Go Gopa Samantha, if you are still with us. Yes, uh, yes uh, Any yeah. concluding yeah. remark? Uh, from your side? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I was just uh, thinking that I missed it and as Professor Saran has pointed out, because if we, if we try to consider the environment and uh, environmental dialogue, especially in cities, we cannot bypass gender question. Because if we think that there is a crisis on any kind of supplies like water or energy, or even given there is a pollution, and then if we think that who are going to suffer most, and then we have to think that, especially in India, water, domestic water is absolutely a domain of women. Then if we think about a water crisis in a city that how can we ignore the gender relations to understand and also even if it is a pollution case or other kinds of environmental crisis because you know day to day maintenance of the household is the prime responsibility of women in this country and if there is a crisis due to environmental degradation or problem whatever it is then the first person who is dealing with this they are women so urban environmental dialogue cannot end without addressing the gender relations in India. And just last one remark, as Professor Sharon has rightly pointed out that, you know, we are in a chain reaction of deteriorating one and triggering another deterioration, et cetera. Like, you know, it's a chain reaction as he rightly pointed out that putting an AC air conditioner and then, and then this heat is being emitted from inside the house to the outside. And then it is, it is creating another heat island. And because of the heat island, the other people are also using air condition. So it's a, like a whole environmental problem is like a vicious chain of reactions. And we are point of time will be able to break that chain to save our cities and to save our humanity. 
So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Samantha, for your for your final remarks. I, I we all agree with you about the significance or the need for giving greater attention to gender-related problems. Uh, you spoke about water. Uh, you know, in in the context of Delhi, and you may be interested in knowing that, on the one hand, Delhi government is is running one or two pilot projects on 24 into 7 uh, supply of drinking water in posh colonies. And on the other hand, there are a whole, whole lot of water consumers living in other areas of the city, uh, the informal areas uh, who are not even connected with pipe supply. Although the Delhi government is, is uh, extending the network from time to time, trying to connect as many of these informal colonies, but uh, there is a huge gap uh, that still exists. Uh, so, so these are all neglected areas. You're absolutely right. Thanks a lot. Uh, and finally, Professor Sati, uh, your uh, concluding remarks uh, would also be very useful to us. Yeah, thank you. But I don't have any now anything to say. Any concluding uh, thoughts? Yeah, only I just uh, thank you very much for inviting me that much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Arjun, is it the time to, to close? I think we, we have extended the time by several minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, would would been, you like to conclude in, in few, a few lines? Uh, I would just say that uh, some very strong signals and messages are coming from uh, today's discussion about, about the, uh, the, the things that have been ignored uh, as we are moving forward towards creating or building our cities, improving our cities. Uh, many things are being ignored. Uh, the important ones highlighted by the speakers are about the need for more alternatives. Uh, if people are provided with alternatives, uh, they would be able to do the same activity in a in a better manner. Uh, the point about the the building voice uh, highlighted by Professor Bhagat is, is very important. Uh, in many uh, cities across the world, we see that there are protests over over the irregularities that are demonstrated by the uh, by the city governments or the national governments, and there is a a large or a huge large population that raises voice and gets things done in the manner in which they, they would want things to be because cities are for the people and 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 uh, unfortunately in the indian context the experience has not been very good in this regard whenever people have tried to raise voices uh, not enough attention or importance is, is still not being given to 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 consider their demands so, so that point is, is absolutely valid and coming out strongly. And the point about uh, uh, gender issues highlighted by Professor Samantha, uh, very, very relevant. Uh, and, and also about the, about, about the point uh, by Professor Sati, uh, the, the, the natural uh, disasters and the potential or the possibilities of, of its occurrence. Uh, so it's it's a little tricky and complicated to to summarize uh, today's discussion in view of the many dimensions. But but as I said, and as we all know, environment is a vast topic. It 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 includes every, everything. It includes everything in a city, and uh, and unless the diversity or the characteristics that cities display are taken into account uh, in a very detailed and careful and slow and steady manner, the problems would remain. So uh, that's the way forward for, for policymakers, the planning community is to capture and develop a better understanding of, of, of the kind of uh, life cities are offering and the emerging challenges and, and to develop their so-called smart solutions, uh, factoring in those, those challenges. So that's all from my side. Over to you, Dr. Arjun Kumar.
Uh, I join you in thanking the distinguished speaker and the panelists, and, and also to your team for a wonderful effort. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, it's almost passed a lot of time. So to formally give a vote of thanks, I invite Anshula. Anshula, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharan, for that very fascinating lecture, which I'm sure has been very enriching and thought provoking for all of our participants and all of us today, and especially relevant with the World Cities Day coming up on 31st October, where the theme this year is Adapting Cities for Climate Resilience. So on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, I, Anshula Mehta, a Senior Assistant Director at IMPRI, would like to thank you once again for sparing your time, being here with us, and sharing your work and your insights on the city as environment. Thank you. I would also like to thank Dr. Rumi Ajaz, our chair for today's session, for steering the discussion, and our discussants, Professor VP Sati, Dr. Ravikant Joshi, Professor Gopa Samantha, and Professor R.B. Bhagat, for sharing their perspectives in this discussion. And finally, I would like to thank all of our participants who joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live or would watch us later on YouTube or listen to us on our podcast. Uh, thank you again. And I hope that you continue to tune in to future episodes of City Conversations, as well as our other web policy talks. I wish you all a good night and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anshula. Thank you. Have a good night.